when the world's most powerful warships face nature's ultimate fury, survival becomes the only mission that matters. This is what happens when a U.S. Navy aircraft carrier hits a massive storm. So let's examine five incidents that reveal how these steel giants fight for their lives against nature's deadliest force. July 8, 2022. The Truman cuts through Mediterranean waters, conducting routine replenishment operations. At 1,092 feet long 100,000 tons, she's a testament to American engineering, until Mother Nature decides otherwise. Without warning, unexpected heavy weather slams into the carrier. Winds exceeding 60 knots, nearly 70 miles per hour, transform the flight deck into a wind tunnel. An FA-18 Super Hornet, worth $67 million, sits chained to the deck as protocol demands. But the chains that should anchor this 32-ton fighter become irrelevant against nature's raw power. The Super Hornet is lifted, twisted, and hurled over the side like a toy plane thrown by an angry child. The $67 million fighter plunges 9,500 feet to the Mediterranean floor. One sailor suffers injuries as the deck becomes a battlefield between human engineering and atmospheric violence. Here's the critical failure. The weather was unexpected. Despite modern forecasting technology, the storm system developed faster than detection systems could track. The replenishment operation, connecting two massive ships with fuel lines in open ocean, created a window of vulnerability. When emergency protocols kicked in, it was already too late. This incident cost the Navy not just $67 million in hardware, but revealed a sobering truth. Even with decades of meteorological advancement, nature can still catch the world's most sophisticated naval force off guard. The Super Hornet was eventually recovered after a 27-day deep-sea salvage operation, but the lesson was clear in the face of sudden weather, and even aircraft carriers become vulnerable. January 14, 1969, off the coast of Hawaii, the USS Enterprise, the world's first nuclear-powered aircraft carrier, prepares for her fourth deployment to Vietnam. The flight deck bristles with 31 fully-fueled and armed aircraft. Below in the hangar, 22 more planes wait, loaded with bombs and Zuni rockets. At 8.18 a.m., as Enterprise turns into morning flight operations, an MD-3 a huffer, a tractor-mounted aircraft starter, unleashes superheated exhaust onto a Zuni rocket. The 15-pound warhead explodes instantly, perforating fuel tanks and igniting JP-5 jet fuel in a hellish cascade. But here's what made it catastrophic. Captain Kent Lee steers the carrier into the wind to blow smoke away from firefighting crews, standard procedure that becomes a nightmare accelerant. The wind fans the flames across the deck as three more Zuni rockets explode, blowing holes through the flight deck and allowing burning fuel to pour into the ship's interior. Within minutes, bombs begin cooking off in the intense heat. An eight by seven foot hole opens in the flight deck. Then comes the nightmare scenario. A 6,000 gallon fuel tank ruptures, creating an 18 by 22 foot inferno that shoots flames through multiple deck levels. For four grueling hours, explosions rock the ship as 500 pound bombs detonate in sequence. The perfect storm of factors, overheated equipment, live ordnance, and environmental conditions that turned routine procedure into catastrophe. The wind that should have saved lives instead spread destruction. Most critically, 28 sailors died, 314 were injured, and 15 aircraft were destroyed at $126 million in 1969 dollars, over $1 billion today. Enterprise survived, but barely. The incident revolutionized carrier firefighting protocols and aircraft handling procedures. It proved that even nuclear-powered supercarriers designed to withstand enemy attack could be crippled by the deadly combination of weather conditions and mechanical failure. December 18, 1944. Admiral William Bull Halsey commands Task Force 38. Seven fleet carriers, six light carriers, eight battleships, and 50 destroyers spread across the Philippine Sea. They're hunting for calm water to refuel. Instead, they sail directly into history's most devastating naval weather disaster. At 110 knots, 126 miles per hour, Typhoon Cobra's winds turn the ocean into liquid mountains. The light carrier USS Langley rolls 70 degrees, her flight deck nearly vertical. 
Aircraft break loose in hangars, smashing into bulkheads and starting fires. On deck, planes are swept overboard like leaves in a hurricane. But the destroyers face annihilation. USS Hull, top heavy from wartime modifications, rolls 50 degrees, then 70. When 110 knot winds hit her beam, water pours down her funnel and into the pilot house. She capsizes with 202 men lost. Only 62 survive. USS Spence, running on fumes with only 15% fuel, attempts to ballast with seawater, too late. The destroyer rolls hard to port and vanishes beneath the waves, taking 294 men with her. Only 23 survive. USS Monaghan suffers the same fate. Stuck ballast valves prevent proper weight distribution. She founders with 250 casualties and just six survivors. Intelligence failure meets tactical disaster. Weather forecasting in 1944 relied on scattered ship reports and guesswork. Halsey's meteorologists placed the storm 450 miles away when it was actually 120 miles distant. The Admiral's attempts to find calm water for refueling put his fleet directly in the typhoon's path. Destroyer captains, desperate to refuel, delayed taking on ballast water until physics made survival impossible. Typhoon Cobra killed 757 men and destroyed 146 aircraft, more American lives lost than many Pacific battles. The disaster forced the Navy to revolutionize weather forecasting, establish Pacific weather stations, and redesign destroyer stability systems. It proved that nature could accomplish what the Japanese Navy couldn't, cripple America's Pacific fleet in a single day. February 12, 2025. The crowded waters off port said, Egypt, become a maritime collision course as the USS Harry S. Truman approaches the Suez Canal entrance. At 11.46 p.m. local time, two massive vessels, American supercarrier and Panamanian bulk carrier, converge in restricted waters with deadly precision. The merchant vessel Besiktas M, 617 feet of loaded cargo ship, plows into Truman's starboard quarter. The impact tears through the carrier's hull above the waterline, piercing storage rooms and damaging the fantail platform where sailors handle critical operations. Here's what made it worse. The collision occurred in weather conditions that limited visibility and maneuverability. Wind at 17 knots from the northwest, five-foot swells, and darkness created the perfect conditions for navigational disaster. In waters where ships need a full nautical mile to stop, there was no room for error. Truman's starboard quarter, the right rear section housing crew quarters, maintenance spaces, and the incinerator system suffers significant damage. The hull breach, though above the waterline, compromises structural integrity and operational capability. No injuries reported, but the carrier must immediately divert to Greek waters for emergency repairs. Restricted seaway navigation meets human error. The Suez Canal approach funnels massive vessels through narrow channels with minimal maneuvering room. Former Navy Captain Carl Schuster identified the core problem. There is not a lot of room for maneuvering in a restricted seaway, and both ships require about one nautical mile to stop. Small navigation mistakes, misreading intentions, or delayed decision-making create disaster with very few viable options. This incident forced the dismissal of Truman's commanding officer and cost millions in repairs and operational delays. It highlighted how even the most advanced warships become vulnerable in congested shipping lanes. The collision demonstrated that in an era of increasing maritime traffic, traditional rules of seamanship matter more than technological superiority. June 5, 1945. The heavy cruiser USS Pittsburgh steams with Task Force 38.1 in the Pacific, 350 miles southeast of Okinawa. At 13,600 tons and 610 feet long, she's built to fight, but not what's coming. A typhoon with winds exceeding 100 knots turns the ocean into a destroyer of ships. At 6.30 a.m., two massive waves strike Pittsburgh in sequence. The first throws her 10 to 15 degrees. The second wave, a wall of water defying comprehension, lifts the bow high into the air while the stern plunges into the following trough. Physics takes over with brutal inevitability. The deck plates buckle upward, straining. Damage control teams race to seal bulkheads as water pours through the jagged opening. Pittsburgh, now resembling a stub-nosed monster, 
maintains steerage and limps toward Guam for repairs. The severed bow, floating independently, earns the nickname McKeesport after Pittsburgh's sister city. Structural engineering meets nature's ultimate stress test. Pittsburgh's design could handle enemy shells and bombs, but not the hydrodynamic forces of a Pacific typhoon. The wave sequence created a fulcrum effect, bow up, stern down, that exceeded the ship's structural limits. Steel that could stop armor-piercing rounds surrendered to water pressure and gravitational force. Pittsburgh's survival without her bow became legendary in naval engineering circles. The incident forced designers to reconsider how ships handle extreme sea states and led to improved structural analysis for heavy weather operations. It proved that sometimes the sea's power exceeds even wartime construction standards, and that skilled seamanship can save lives even when physics fails. Behind every survival story lies human courage under impossible pressure. When USS Enterprise burned off Hawaii, sailors like Airman John R. Webster died instantly in the first explosion. But others, whose names history didn't record, ran toward 1,000-degree flames to shut off fuel lines that fed the inferno. During Typhoon Cobra, destroyer escort USS Taberer became a hero ship rescuing 55 survivors from ships that vanished beneath the waves. Her crew fought mountainous seas for three days, pulling men from the water while their own ship rolled and pitched in the typhoon's aftermath. These incidents reveal a pattern. When technology fails, human judgment and seamanship determine survival. Captain Kent Lee steering Enterprise into the wind. Pittsburgh's crew sealing bulkheads after their bow disappeared. Taberer's sailors refusing to abandon the search for survivors. Today's carriers integrate satellite meteorology, computerized storm tracking, and real-time oceanographic data. They can outrun most weather systems, Nimitz-class carriers exceed 30 knots, faster than many storms. When avoidance fails, modern damage control systems, trained crews, and structural improvements provide survival margins earlier ships lacked. Aircraft carriers resist storm damage through fundamental physics principles that work even when technology fails. The real question isn't whether aircraft carriers can survive massive storms, History proves they can. The question is whether we've learned enough from past disasters to prevent the next one. Because somewhere in the world's oceans, another storm is building. Another carrier is steaming toward an uncertain forecast. And the eternal battle between human engineering and natural force continues. When a U.S. Navy aircraft carrier hits a massive storm, survival depends on three things. The strength of steel, the wisdom of design, and the courage of sailors who refuse to surrender to the sea.